I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And I'm Tiffany Bates. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. This week, we're talking about guns, gifts, and we're joined by Sixth Circuit Judge Amul Thapar. So first up in SCOTUS news, we have a few updates in cases we discussed recently. First up, the court denied the petition to rehear the non-delegation case, uh, Gundy. Justice Kavanaugh, as we expected, wrote a statement respecting denial in another similar non-delegation case, signaling his interest in hearing such a case in the future. The court also denied the National Review petition. This was a First Amendment challenge to the lower court's refusal to dismiss climate scientist Michael Mann's defamation claim over attacks on his hockey stick graph. Justice Sam Alito dissented from the denial, saying the case went to the very heart of the constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Uh, He wrote, the protection afforded to journalists and others who use harsh language in criticizing opposing advocacy on one of the most important issues of our day. And finally, the court denied Anand Syed's petition challenging the lower court's refusal to grant him a new trial based on his lawyer's ineffective assistance, which is not surprising because those cases are very hard to make. Definitely. So I suppose that may be the end of the road for the serial case. Moving on, the court granted cert in one new case since we last met. It's Tanzan versus Tanvir. And the question presented is whether RIFRA permits suits seeking money damages against individual federal employees. So RIFRA, this is the law that protects against government uh, substantially burdening the free exercise of religion. The language of RIFRA says that litigants may obtain appropriate relief against a government. The suit was brought by Muslim men, some who are U.S. citizens and others who are lawful permanent residents, who refused, partly based on their religious beliefs, to provide information about other Muslims to the FBI in a terrorism-related investigation. They say that FBI agents then placed them on the no-fly list as retaliation, and this forced them into an impermissible choice between obeying their sincerely held religious beliefs or violating their beliefs to avoid being placed on the no-fly list. So they sued and requested injunctive relief against the agents in their official capacities, but they also requested damages against the agents in their individual capacities. The Supreme Court previously held that the Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, which is similar to RIFRA, has similar language, uh, does not allow damages against a state, but it did not discuss individual capacity damages suits. So the federal government asked the court to take up this case, arguing that the lower court ruling granting money damages clears the way for a slew of future suits against national security officers, criminal investigators, correctional officers, and countless other federal employees seeking to hold them personally liable for alleged burdens on any of the myriad religious practices engaged in by the people of our nation. So we'll be talking more about this case when it's set for argument in the spring, but we wanted to flag that it has been added to the docket. And next up, the court heard a pretty big case this week, New York Pistol and Rifle Association versus City of New York. And the question in this case is whether the city's ban on transporting a licensed, locked, and unloaded handgun to a home or shooting range outside the city limits is consistent with the Second Amendment, the Commerce Clause, and the constitutional right to travel. So New York City banned individuals from taking their guns outside of their homes except to go to seven gun ranges located in the city. And gun owners who wanted to take their guns to gun ranges outside of the city limits and to second homes in upstate New York uh, challenged this city regulation. So there's an incredibly strong case that that regulation is unconstitutional. Lower courts across the country have been ignoring um, the Supreme Court's decision in Heller rather than using a text history and tradition framework. They've been applying the tiers of scrutiny, usually intermediate scrutiny, in these cases. But the hiccup in this case is that New York State has since passed legislation that would allow the challengers to transport their firearms to other ranges and to their other homes. So now there's a serious question of whether the case is moot. Uh, New York City argues that their regulation has now been preempted, so they couldn't go back and implement the regulation again if they wanted to, um, and that the plaintiffs got exactly the relief they wanted to transport their guns outside of the city limits. 
Petitioners did not make a specific request for damages in their complaint, so the city says that doesn't keep this case alive either. But petitioners did ask in kind of a catch-all language for all the relief they're entitled to. So theoretically, they would be allowed to go back to the district court and amend their complaint and specifically ask for damages. But so the interesting question here is whether that's enough to keep this case alive. Paul Clement, who represents the petitioners, didn't rely on that argument, though. The United States, as an amicus, had suggested that damages argument. So Paul Clement argued instead that they didn't get everything they wanted and they're worried about enforcement for past violations. So I think the city had said an argument below or in some filing that they weren't going to prosecute past violations that were now in compliance with the current law. And so the current law says that even though you can transport your guns outside of the city, that has to be continuous and uninterrupted. So meaning you can't stop for coffee or anything like that or bathroom break. A trip to your mother's house, that was what Justice Alito wanted to know. Can you stop at your mother's? (laughs) Yes. So they say we we didn't get everything we wanted and we're we're still afraid of that. And we, we could be prosecuted for that. So the the lawyer for the city basically said, well, we pinky swear that we're not going to go after those types of offenders, but I'm not sure that that's sufficient for the shooting club members <laughs> who brought this challenge. Yeah, I don't think that gives them a lot of solace. And Paul Clement also argued that respondents were strategically trying to moot this case in passing those laws. So there could be a voluntary cessation problem. Although it is more complicated since it was the state that passed the new law rather than the city ordinance. Yeah, based on the the argument, so Justice Kavanaugh did not ask any questions. Justice Thomas, which is pretty standard, didn't ask any questions. Uh, the Chief Justice only asked a couple of questions, only of the lawyer for New York, and they were all about mootness. Uh, but Justices Alito and Gorsuch uh, seemed to recognize uh, this sort of 11th hour unfair dealing of uh, what New York did to to basically take the case away from the court after both sides had agreed to this very lengthy briefing schedule that gave the state and the city plenty of time to um, engage in a little bit of skullduggery and, and try to moot the case. Yeah, so it'll be interesting to see whether they decide to go to the merits in this case or whether they say it's moot and maybe take up one of the myriad other Second Amendment petitions um, challenging similar laws. Yeah, there's there's no shortage of that, certainly. Well, moving on, since we are now officially in the Christmas season, we wanted to give you some gift ideas for the SCOTUS lovers in your life. So first up is Justice Gorsuch's book, A Republic If You Can Keep It. This is a collection of speeches, judicial opinions, and anecdotes offering advice to legal and lay audiences on the importance of civility, courage, and humility in American society. It also offers a rare glimpse into the justice's private world, sharing stories about his final moments of anonymity before he was thrust onto the national stage uh, with his nomination to the Supreme Court. I love some of the stories that he includes, such as how one of his neighbors in Colorado helped him evade the reporters who were camped out near his his house in the countryside, and uh, how he he sat next to a little girl on the plane ride to Washington, and she asked if he would draw with her, and then she got scared at one point and and said, can you hold my hand? Um, So it was just sort of uh, sweet little anecdotes. And this is available on Amazon, and it's currently only $18 for the hard copy. It's a good deal. So next up... We have some T-shirts. So if you are interested in getting a gym membership in the new year, you should grab one of these Descent is My Cardio T-shirts from (laughs) LookHuman.com. I think they're supposed to be like feminist shirts, but I think they work much better in the, you know, Supreme Court context. We would know. If I saw that, I would immediately think, oh, court. They're pretty cute and they're available in sweatshirts, even baby onesies, as well as <laughs> T-shirts and tank tops. So also from Look Human, uh, for fans of the Notorious RBG, they have a mug that says, I'm judging you, with a picture of the justice. And here's their description. It says, the ultimate judge, Ruth, is going to bring the truth. Show uh, your love of RBG with this sassy Supreme Court justice design. So you can get an 11-ounce mug for fourteen ninety nine or a 15-ounce mug for seventeen ninety nine. And speaking of mugs, look no further than our very own SCOTUS 101 mugs. They're 8 
$14.99 on shop.heritage.org. But you can get 30% off and free shipping if you enter four bananas. That's all one word. The number four and bananas at checkout. And while there's no shortage of SCOTUS merch celebrating the ladies on the court, I searched high and low to find something Alito themed uh, because in the past I have been able to find, you know, some Clarence Thomas yeah, things. It's like one Clarence Thomas themed mug, which I have. <laughs> you know, there's uh, there's also some Gorsuch stuff and Kavanaugh. Uh, but I, I wanted to find something Alito themed. Uh, the only thing I could find after scouring the Internet, and this would be for a true diehard fan of Sam Alito, is a green bag bobblehead that is on eBay right now made by the the Green Bag Law Review. Uh, They put out a new bobblehead, I think, every year of a different justice. And it's $900. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So at that price, you could buy 100 SCOTUS 101 mugs, or you could try to get the the Sam Alito bobblehead, which which does come with uh, with a mug. I think I'd rather just stop for some pink flamingos to remind (laughs) me of Justice Alito. (laughs) And finally, if you prefer to give experiential gifts, we suggest a trip to the Supreme Court cafeteria for its newest offering, which is pizza, thanks to Justice Kavanaugh. Though I'm not positive it's the pizza has been... Um, Hasn't arrived yet. Yeah, isn't there yet. But we will let you know when it officially is. We're going to we, take a field trip at some point. Yeah, we'll we'll do that. We can, we can gram it. And you should also head out to the movie theater in January to see Created Equal, in his own words, the new documentary about Justice Thomas that we've previously talked about. So those are our recommendations for the SCOTUS fan in your life for this upcoming holiday season. Uh, well, next up, I recently spoke with Judge Amol Thapar. Amol Thapar is a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. Welcome to SCOTUS 101, Judge. Thank you for having me. So let's start out with your early career. After law school, you clerked for civil rights icon Judge Nathaniel Jones on the Sixth Circuit. Tell me about him and what you learned from your time in his chambers. Yeah, so Judge Jones was an incre- is an incredible human being and an incredible mentor. You know, I learned a number of things from him. First, he was this great American patriot, and he had this passionate love for our country. He truly believed. I mean, he saw amazing change during his lifetime, and he also helped with the South African Constitution. And so he saw how great our country truly was. And I loved how he talked about the greatness of the American people. And to me, that really resonated with me. The other thing was he kind of lived this every day in his life. He treated people really well. So I'd go to lunch with him, and I still do, in fact, and I'd notice how well he just genuinely treated people and what he thought of people. And I thought, this is remarkable. He's now in his mid-90s and still just one of the happiest people I've ever met. And finally, he was very welcoming to me. When I interviewed with him, I shared with him my judicial philosophy, which was very different than his. And he said, (laughs) oh, this is going to be a fun year. And... He and I would often debate, whether over lunch or over opinions or over the material we were working on, and I was amazed at how willing he was to listen to me, kind of a young punk out of law school's views, so different from his own. And here was a guy with, you know, battle scars and gray hair, but I thought— this is really unique, like being well, willing to listen and test his own views with mine and battle with me. And I loved that he loved the passion I had for my views, even if I disagreed with him. That's wonderful. So uh, fast forward, you've been a judge for more than a decade now, uh, but you also spent time as a U.S. attorney in private practice and as an adjunct law professor. So what's been your favorite job? Well, anyone that's been a U.S. attorney will tell you being the United States attorney is the greatest job in the world. And for me, being an assistant U.S. attorney was truly special, but being the United States attorney was amazing uh, for a number of reasons. First, imagine a child of immigrants. You grow up hearing from your parents, like I did from Judge Jones, how great this country was and what opportunities it provides for us, for those who work hard. 
and then getting to say Amul Thapar on behalf of the United States of America. It still sends a chill down mm-hmm. my spine every time I say it. And then being able to be the United States attorney and be the representative of a district of great men and women whose only goal every day is to do the right thing and put their head down on the pillow knowing they did the right thing. And that's an amazing opportunity. And so I can't think there was a better job. And if you think about when I was U.S. attorney, it was in a post 9-11 world. Mm -hmm. And so the 94 U.S. attorneys who themselves were these amazing men and women throughout the country, um, all of us were bound together by this common goal that meant so much to us. And for me, it was really personally it meant a lot. I was on a plane on 9-11 headed to Los Angeles and got diverted to St. Louis. And I vowed to the man upstairs that if I ended up on the ground, I would go into public service and never leave. And I've adhered to that promise. And it, it my wife was pregnant with my daughter and my son was one year old. And so when you're up in a plane and you realize what's going mm-hmm. on, it it resonates with you. And the opportunity to go back and represent this great country was really special for me. Oh, that's really powerful. So if you hadn't gone into the law, what do you think you'd be doing today? So my parents always wanted me to be a doctor. <laughs> and you'll be happy to know that I, my sister became the crown jewel of the family. She's a doctor. <laughs> and I did not become a doctor. And I probably would have tried, but anyone that knows me would not want me being their doctor. And so (laughs) I probably would have gone on business. Although now, growing older myself, uh, you know, at 50 years old now, I now know why my parents wanted me to be a doctor. I now want my kids to be a doctor. So so someone will truly take care of me as I get older. (laughs) So you were appointed to the district court by President Bush in 2007, where you served until your appointment to the Sixth Circuit. Do you miss being a trial court judge where you're running the show on your own uh, versus now being one of 16 judges on an appeals court? I love my colleagues, but I miss it a lot. I miss the opportunity that when you're done with an opinion and happy with it, it can go out. (laughs) I miss the people I got to work with and interact with every day. It's a much different job. You know, being a trial judge is not as isolating as being a court of appeals judge. And while I love the isolation because I love my law clerks, I love the opportunities to interact with my colleagues. It's a different kind of isolation. But when you're a trial judge, you're interacting with the lawyers. Mm -hmm. You're interacting with the staff a lot more. Uh, You get to know the staff. You get to know their families. And to me, uh, going to Pikeville, Kentucky, which is this crown jewel in Kentucky, and the people are wonderful, and the staff was so great. And I just loved being a trial judge there. It was it was. You know, we we called the lawyers there very affectionately country lawyers. They're some of the best <laughs> lawyers in the world. And it's because they lived their craft, so mm-hmm. to speak. I mean, you'd they were counselors and attorneys. They weren't just attorneys. And I think often in the big cities, that skill is lost where you're a counselor to the people you represent. You help them and you represent them. And I think the first part of that often has been lost on the profession, but not by the people of Pikeville. And you saw that even in court. So you're adjusting to the somewhat monastic life of being an appellate judge? I am adjusting to it. I love it. I get to spend more time studying uh, the law Mm -hmm. and spending time writing, which I love doing. On the district court, we called it run, fun, and gun. You were always (laughs) on the move. Um, It was a lot of fun, but you were shooting from the hip a lot more. Now, all those district court decisions that are made in two seconds, I get to spend six months studying and micromanaging. And I I do love that part of the job. Well, speaking of writing, uh, your judicial opinions are a delight to read. They're often peppered with uh, pop culture references. I think one of my favorites was when you were sitting by designation on the 11th Circuit. It's the the B-Girls case (laughs) where you worked in references to the Ninth Commandment, Pappy Van Winkle, and both Sherlock. Luck and Oliver Wendell Holmes. Don't forget Old Crow. Oh, of, of course. <laughs> now, do you have any role models for writing? You know, I mean, perhaps there, there's some just amazing justices that have been writers, right? Justice Jackson was one of the great, great writers of all time. But perhaps for me, the role model is Justice Scalia. And I don't know that I could ever aspire to be Justice Scalia. But the great thing about Justice Scalia is you pick up one of his opinions You read it, and no matter what it's about, right, it can be about the most boring subject. He somehow 
makes it interesting. <laughs> and he has these great lines, and he's just – he knew how to put sentences together in a special way. Not mm-hmm. only was he a phenomenal writer, but he made it really, really interesting to read, and he made it fun to read. Mm-hmm. And – so if I ever aspire to write like someone, it'd be Justice Scalia, but I know I can never reach that pinnacle. But I just admire the way he wrote. I admire the way he spoke. He spoke like he wrote. And mm-hmm. he'd go out and if you listen to his speeches, and there's these great books, Scalia Speaks and Scalia on Faith, mm-hmm. um, that have been put together and by Ed Whalen and Christopher Scalia. And these books are phenomenal. But if you... Go out and actually get on, like, YouTube and watch his speeches. They're so powerful, and his opinions are just like that. Yeah. And very few people can master that craft. Now, do you have any writing tips you can share? So I always think, you know, one of the things I hope you notice about the Court of Appeals opinions I've written is I've tried— to keep them under 10 pages. And I feel like— I appreciate that. (laughs) Well, no one's ever picked up a—you know, put down a brief or put down an opinion and said, boy, I wish that was longer, right? Very few people do that. And so whenever my opinions are more than 10 pages, I feel bad because I got tired, I got lazy, or I quit. (laughs) And so I think it's really important to learn the skill of writing short. And I think too few judges do it. Mm -hmm. We have too many long opinions. And let me tell you why that's a problem, because I was once a district judge. And district judges don't have time to read 70-page opinions. They're trying to get a rule statement, apply it, and do the best job they can. Mm -hmm. And when we have these long and voluminous opinions where you got to hunt for the rule statement, that's a lot of busy work for trial lawyers and district judges who have real jobs. <laughs> now, shifting gears a bit, you're on President Trump's not-so-short short list for the Supreme Court. How did you learn about this? So I was walking out of the courtroom. I was a trial judge at the time, and so we were often in court, and I was walking out of the courtroom, and one of my clerks said, hey, judge, you're on the list. And I said, the list? What list? (laughs) And as you know, I I was not on the first list. And the first list a lot of people thought was so great that why would he ever create a second list? Of course, we all know who was on the second list, a man named Neil Gorsuch. And so uh, I was honored to be on the list, but I was surprised to hear it and had no clue that I would end up on the list. And it's a great honor to be Mm -hmm. on a list with so many just remarkable jurists and people. And mm-hmm. so it's an honor, but I was shocked. <laughs> so now your chambers are in Covington, Kentucky. Do you have anything in your chambers that represents where you're from or your personality? Yeah. So I got a few things. Uh, my chamber is littered with – or littered is a bad word, but it's it's got a lot of my kids' things, meaning <laughs> it's got baseball helmets from Nick. It's got pictures and crafts that Zach made for me as a child. It's got all kinds of stuff that Carmen has made for me. And then they've all made like birthday pictures, all kinds of stuff. Mm-hmm. And I love that when you look around my chambers, you see drawings from my kids. You see all the things um, as my kids get older that remind me of what is really important in life, which is your family and my wife and children. Mm -hmm. And to me, nothing's more important. There's nothing that matters more to me. And I see those reminders every day. And I I always think back of when I was a a baby judge, so to speak, new to the judiciary, and one of my colleagues told me, you know, when you become a judge, it can go to your head because everyone calls you <laughs> judge. If you say a lamp would look good, good there, the next day a lamp will show up there. <laughs> and as I was learning all this, I thought, boy, it really can go to your head. And I went home one day, and Nick was about six or seven years old, my youngest. And I said, hey, Nick, clean up your stuff. And he turned and looked at me and said, you're not the boss of me. Mom is. <laughs> and I think that really quickly I was reminded by my children, and it's good to have their stuff around, that I'm still a dad and I'm still a husband and I'm very fallible and make <laughs> many, many mistakes every day. And so that being one thing is uh, I love having in my chambers. I also have when you walk into my chambers – The first thing you see is a Norman Rockwell painting of the judge, and it's called The Right to Know. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is really important um, that my clerks and I see that every day 
Because I think another part about opinions to get back is that you should make your opinions understandable. And what mm-hmm. I always tell um, my law clerks is I want the person on the street. I don't want them to agree or disagree. I want them to be able to read my opinion and understand it. So when you go to law school, they hand you Black's Law Dictionary. And what I told them is if I ever get anything where I have to look it up in Black's Law Dictionary, I'm going to puke. <laughs> and the reason is, is you should write in a way that a lay person can pick it up and understand. And that painting reminds me of that. It also reminds us, hopefully, that Justice delayed is justice denied, and it's important to be timely with our work and work Mm -hmm. hard so that we get decisions out. And the final thing I have, maybe the most important thing in my chambers, is every day I see it, it's right next to my desk. My roommate from college, Sean Celine, is a general in the Marines. And I had maybe the greatest speaking engagement ever. I got invited to speak at the Marine Ball by Sean. And... He sent me, of course, it had to go through security, and I, my court security called me when it did an ammo box. Uh, it, it's, <laughs> it's this Marine ammo box, basically the boxes they carry with all their ammo. And uh, I have that in chambers because it reminds me every day that the job we do is simple. And the real heroes are the men and women who mm-hmm. protect us every day, who stand on that wall when we go to sleep, who work the holidays, whether they like it or not, who can't get sick because they have the responsibility of defending us. And to me, there's nothing more important. And it's good for me every day to see that ammo box and know there's people out there sleeping in the desert protecting our way of life. Now, I went to school across the river in Cincinnati, so I'm, I'm not sorry. sure that <laughs> that all that many people are familiar with Covington. So if someone had an afternoon to spend in Covington, where would you recommend they go? So there's three places. First, they should go to Skyline Chili. Oh, of course. And have our local cuisine, which is phenomenal, as you know. <laughs> it's not my favorite kind of chili, but... Yeah, a lot of people say that, but it grows on you. It's an and acquired it becomes, taste. Yes, it's an acquired taste. This will be your favorite, and if it's not, I'm going to walk out. But um, <laughs> I would then take them to Grater's Ice Cream. Oh, yes. Yeah. Which is the best ice cream in the country. Yes. And black raspberry chip, I would insist they taste. <sighs> yeah. And after that, we'd go to one of these bourbon bars slash speakeasies so they could taste some of the local flair, so to speak, (laughs) and understand the difference between Pappy Van Winkle and Old Crow, to quote my decision. Um, And so, but there's a lot of neat things in Covington and in the northern Kentucky side of the river, Mm -hmm. um, including like the river walk and the beauty of the area. Yeah, it's a great area. Yeah, and things like that. But to me, the food, the people, and the bourbon are what (laughs) Kentucky's all about. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, do you have any traditions with your with your law clerks? Any special outings, uh, perhaps to any of these speakeasies? Yeah, so we do. We have a lot of special kind of things we do. The first and my maybe my favorite is our reunion, mm-hmm. where we get all of our clerks uh, come back together. What I tell my clerks when I hire them is, you give me a year of your life, I'll give you the rest of it. And they don't know what they're signing up for when I say <laughs> that, but they get an additional parent, so to yeah. speak. And so they all come back, and we will go and shoot guns and eat great burgers, and then we have this putt putt competition. And I hope you know that I'm pretty modest, but you should ask them if you meet them who is the defending champion of the putt putt competition. It gets pretty competitive. <laughs> and I've happened to win a number of occasions. One of my clerks, Sam Rudman, is always bitter about my victories. <laughs> and uh, but it's really fun and we have a great time together. Another tradition we've recently started with Judge Oldham's chambers is something called bullets and bourbon and preferably in that order. Mm -hmm. Um, And we get our two chambers together for a weekend every year. We do one year in Kentucky, the next year in Texas and back and forth. And one of the clerks stays, each of the clerks stay with one of the clerks and then Judge Oldham and I stay together. And we get to know each other really well. And it's just nice because Andy and I are very good friends to have this every year reu- kind of reunion, mm-hmm. but new clerks, new families, get everyone to know each other. 
Then with Judge Nalbandian's chambers, we go uh, every other week out for either happy hour or dinner or something like that. He's the other local chambers. Mm -hmm. And so we've had a lot of fun doing that. And we eat lunch together every day, which provides a real opportunity just to sit and talk. And we do it in my conference room, and we'll go out and get lunch or bring it in. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of fun, and it gives us the ability to let off some steam and talk about whatever we want. That sounds great. So a lot of SCOTUS 101 listeners are law students and young lawyers just starting out. So what advice would you give them? So I would tell them be confident in your views. And to me, it's hard. You go through law school um, and your views are constantly challenged and you should Mm -hmm. listen and you should make your views better through listening. But it's important to me that you be very confident but you test your views as well. And the nice thing about if you consider yourself an originalist is most of the literature these days is about originalism. Why? I think of originalism like Apple, the Apple computer brand. We're not – originalists aren't trying to beat the competition. We're trying to make ourselves better. If you notice, Apple's not competing with anyone. They're just trying <laughs> to make the iPhone better. They're just trying to make things better. And originalists are like that. And if you read all the literature, it's not originalism is better than acts. It's how can we make originalism better? And so you've got to be constantly willing to reassess and test your views. And then the final thing is, is if you are an originalist and textualist, you better be the hardest worker because it's hard work. You Mm -hmm. don't come in and just know the answer. You have to work and go through the source material to figure it out. And that is a lot of work. And sometimes it's late nights and sometimes it's early mornings. And so it's really important that you be the hardest worker. Now, one final question uh, that I ask all guests at SCOTUS 101. If you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would you pick and what would you talk about? Okay, so I would pick John Marshall Harlan. Do you know why? Uh, Because he's from Kentucky. Because he's from (laughs) Kentucky. But he's also was born into a slaveholding family. Mm -hmm. And he was the great dissenter, as we know, dissented in the slave rights cases, dissented in Plessy versus Ferguson. And he always he was the original originalist, as Mm -hmm. he's been called. He always did what he thought the law compelled, no matter the consequences, no matter what his family thought of him, no matter what anyone thought of him. And if you look at him, you see someone who truly epitomized duty to law, Mm -hmm. not public opinion, duty to law. And that's what he followed. And I'd love to sit down and talk to him about that and understand, like, you know, the courage he had to follow the law, to be the original originalist. And so it'd have to be John Marshall Harlan. <laughs> That's who I would pick as well. Cool, good. All right. Well, before I let you go, since uh, you're a fellow Kentuckian, I wanted to play a Kentucky word association game. Uh, so best bourbon. Wellers. Wellers. Okay. Do you know what it is? Uh, I haven't had Wellers. You haven't had I'm, Wellers? I'm, I'm partial to bullet. Okay. So can I tell you what Weller's please, is? Okay, please. I don't want this podcast to go over. I talk a lot. But Weller's is um, it's the beauty of being a trial, former trial judge, right? You get to talk <laughs> as much as you want. Weller's is the poor man's pappy. And Buffalo okay. Trace hopefully won't be offended that I said this. But when they, they make, you know, hundreds of barrels that are pappy, but the ones that don't make the taste test of 20 people – That's right. At different segments become Wellers. So for someone like me that can never afford (laughs) Pappy, I'm on a government salary (laughs) and that, uh, you know, wants to drink tasty bourbon, Wellers is the way to go. It's good enough. (laughs) All right. Best Derby winner. Oh. If you follow. Secretariat. Secretariat. Okay. Um, I I looked up a a couple of things that I thought might be interesting. So there was citation in 1948, Triple Crown winner. I thought that's appropriate for a judge. Right. And affirmed uh, 1978, uh, Triple Crown winner. You came up with good ones. Uh, I think perhaps my favorite is um, the first filly to win in 1912, and her name was Regret. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Best fried chicken. Oh, so have you ever been to the Greyhound Tavern? I have. 
the Greyhound Tavern on Monday night in Northern Kentucky on Buttermilk Pike <laughs> has the best fried chicken around. They have it all week, but on Monday night is fried chicken night. <laughs> all right. Now, you might have already given your answer for this one. Best son or daughter of Kentucky? Wow. Well, can I claim Abraham Lincoln? Um, I think he counts. Yeah. Yeah, he was born in Kentucky. Yeah. I think I'd go with Lincoln over Harlan. I'd have to, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah, he's up there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, final one. Best Kentucky delicacy. Oh, wow. Is so, there are some interesting... Uh, so derby pie oh. is wonderful mm -hmm. if you like sweets. Of course, the fried chicken is not necessarily a delicacy. Um, and then the bourbon, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, I, I always bring a derby pie to my husband's family's Thanksgiving. They're from Maryland, so they, you know, didn't know what derby pie was, and now it's a standard. We have to have that uh, that derby pie. So, what's your best del Kentucky delicacy? Um, probably derby pie, maybe Benedictine spread, the okay. cucumber yeah. on sandwiches. Um, I'm also partial to the hot brown sandwich because I'm hot from Brown's Louisville. Hot wonderful. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that's more of a Louisville thing. That is, that yeah. is. So. Um, Okay, well, I, that that was that was it for my Kentucky Word Association. Um, but thank you so much for joining me. This was a delight to have you on the podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a true pleasure. Thanks for listening to SCOTUS 101. Be sure to subscribe on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And please leave us a five-star rating. You can also follow us on Twitter at SCOTUS 101 and email us at SCOTUS 101 at heritage.org with questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Elizabeth Slattery. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Thalia Rampersad, and Mark Guiney. For more information, visit heritage.org.